Hello and welcome to one more program in the business platform. Um, the, the program where we give you, the small, medium-sized business owner, the tools, techniques and attitudes that you need not only to survive but to th thrive in today's business environment. And it's my big pleasure to, to welcome our guest today, Gordon Tredko, um, who's a, an author, speaker, consultant, um, huge amount of experience in, in the world of leadership and business. Um, it's got a ton of great stuff to, to share with us. Gordon, welcome. Thank you for being on the show. Um, maybe you, just start, um, just introduce yourself. I know I know thousands, hundreds of thousands of people know you um, from your your, your, media, your social media platform. But just introduce yourself to, to our audience. Yeah, so, so my name's Gordon Treadgold. I'm from uh, Leeds in the north of England. Um, uh, I have a background in mathematics, which got me uh, moving into uh, IT, where I was uh, started as a programmer and then became a project uh, manager, turnaround expert, uh, and leading and driving large change programs. And did that for 25 years, leading teams of up to thousand people and running projects programs 150 million 250 million dollar departments and when i decided i wanted to write about uh, leadership um i i always got great feedback you know i delivered i was one of those people that you, you, you meet a lot of people who deliver great results but nobody ever wants to work for them again yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of dead bodies and i wasn't like that i was i, I created a uh, you know, I found that you you needed the people in order to be successful, uh, and part of the what we need to do is make sure that we take care of them. Uh, and by doing that, I was able to not only achieve great results, but have high staff retention uh, and have people looking to want to come and work with me. So I wanted to share the approaches that I used um, to do that, both from a leadership perspective, but also as well how I turned failing projects around because it's great to be able to engage people but once you've done that you've got to be able to tell them what to do sure. you can't just be a you know if you're a nice guy that everybody loves but you don't generate results that's a career that doesn't have a long shelf life <laughs> popular but not getting it done so I, I kind of mix the two Wonderful, wonderful. And just so that everybody knows just how international we are today. So I, I'm a Scotsman who lives in Brazil um, and has a global practice. And Gordon's an Englishman who lives in Spain and has a global practice. So we're, we're covering most corners of the world um, <laughs> in, in today's conversation. So maybe let's just kick off on, I mean, you being in Europe and, and, and obviously in South America, we're passing through different phases of the whole pandemic and post-pandemic and things like that. What, what's your reading of the current scenario from, from where you are? How, how is, what, what does the business landscape look like? Uh, I think we don't like to think that by Q4, everybody's going to be vaccinated and we're going to be back to, back to normal. And yet the UK have vaccinated 50% of the people and, um, Boris Johnson's announced a five thousand euro fine, a five thousand pound fine for anybody who travels abroad, and that's with fifty percent of the population vaccinated. So, so I don't think anything's going to be back to normal in in twenty twenty one. Yeah, whatever whatever normal means. Um, so I, I I think we're going to see more of the same for the next. Um, you know, I think we've got another twelve months of this. Yeah. So, uh, and a lot of a lot of what we've seen happening, I think people have battened down the hatches, tightened the purse strings, adapted, and are trying to survive to to get to normal. Uh, and and yet that's going to be another twelve months. I mean, for me, I, you know, this time last year, well, January last year, I had uh, sixteen speaking gigs lined up. At the moment, I have. 
two, and they're in December. And I, I'm yeah. not convinced they'll they'll go ahead. So, and a lot of the in-person training I did, you know, again, people are talking about it, but they don't know when. Um, you know, but I'm being asked to go to Ghana, but I, you know, I'm not. I even if I was vaccinated, would I want to do that? I'd have to investigate and see what the situation there. So I think what we're going to see is people are going to have to adapt their business and take it out of just survival mode and and really think about how do I do? How am I going to be different permanently rather than hoping? You know, it's a bit like, you know, we're a bit like a, a couple and, and she's left and you sat there hoping she's going to come back. And, you know, maybe we just need to realise she's not and we've got to move, we've got to find a way forward um, yeah. in this new, uh, with this new paradigm. Yeah, I was I was talking, I had on, on the show last week, um, the lady who's head of talent at um, Renault, Renault Nissan, so 350,000 employees and, you know, global scale um and she was saying that from their point of view it's been 10 years of innovation in in a year yeah. you know the, the paradigms that have shifted the technologies that shifted um like you said the, the world like it or not the world works very can, can i just say something i like that so they've had 10 years of innovation in a year anybody who hasn't done anything and is always going to get better they've just had 10 years of stagnation yeah. In a year, yeah. yeah. So I, it just, that just occurred to me as you said that one more ten years of innovation. It's like wow, anybody who didn't is now ten years behind. How are you going to close that gap? Yeah, you're you're not. So let, let's talk about you know if, if you've got a medium sized business. I mean, the big businesses, you know, they've they've got the McKinsey's, the Deloitte's, you and I, they're all getting their help. The small medium sized businesses, what do they need to do? To reinvent themselves so i actually think the small and medium-sized businesses are in a better position because even if you know and i work with i'll work with anybody but, um but i think with uh, with the larger companies i've worked with a lot of big companies uh, you know i've worked with dhl um, as a permanent employee before i started on the lead show i worked with a company called henkel a 20 billion dollar company and Whilst these companies, you know, were cash rich, a lot of resources, they are, they have the flexibility of an oil tanker. It, it takes them, you know, even though they innovate 10 years in one year, it's probably still going to take them a while to implement it. So I think, I think the smaller, um, you know, medium sized businesses are probably a lot nimbler. Uh, and we'll be able to change direction quickly. The challenge is going to be figuring out what that direction is. Yeah. yeah. And I think you know it, it would be it would be good to you know get some consulting in or or speak with similar businesses that and you know non competitors like you, you know they do through a lot of uh, you know things like the Vistage groups where CEOs meet and see what some of the other businesses are doing and learn from them. Watch what some of the bigger businesses are doing and do it quicker than they're doing. I mean, one of the things here that stunned me yet um, on Saturday, I was walking past um, the only local pizza parlor in, uh, in the village where I live and it's closed down. And before I moved here, I lived in Belgium and the, the, the pizza parlor there trebled its revenue during the pandemic and i was looking at it's like how can a pizza pie, what did they get wrong i mean it's it's delivered and they don't deliver they don't deliver uh, the demand's going to be there because everybody yeah everybody will eat pizza and yet they 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 didn't deliver the required customers to come and visit and where we are um, we're we're coming out of the lockdown now, but you, I live between, I live in a small town of about twenty five hundred, and there's a town of fifty thousand one side and, and twenty five the other, and if it's a town of fifty thousand weekends, you're not allowed to to leave it or enter. So 
you know, people couldn't. I mean, if you were making food deliveries, that was possible. But they relied on people coming to them. And yet, and, and yet the, there was a, a, a curfew. They, they opened at 9 o'clock at night, and yet the curfew kicked in at 10. Why are you not adapting to your, you know, you have a del something that's easy to deliver, and yet you've gone bust? How was that possible? That's an interesting thing because I, you know, I, I, I see the same thing. That the, way, the way I tell people is your business is not going to exist in 18 months' time. Yeah. It's either going to be another business or you're going to be closed. Yeah. Your business as it is right now isn't going to exist. Now, as you said, people are still going to need to eat. People are still going to need to vacation. People are still going to need to do all the things that people need to do. It's just going to look different. And and I think that's a beautiful example you just gave of somebody who's able to, to pivot and say, here's the opportunity, let's go after it. And someone says, no, but we've been like this since World War II. We're, you know, we're, we're going to carry on. It's like, unfortunately, the, the world doesn't care. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to stay the same, the world doesn't care. No, and one of the stories that I heard prior to all the pandemic, which I, I thought was interesting, um, was you know the, the way that things are changing. Prior to the pandemic, it took Sony a hundred years to get to, I think it was 17 billion in revenue. It took WhatsApp uh, and 100,000 100, staff to get to 17 billion and a hundred years. And it took WhatsApp about 15 employees and seven years to get to 17 billion. And then you look at what's happening in the pandemic, the, the, the lifespan of businesses, businesses that are, you know, people are going to be making big money very, very quickly if they can adapt and become flexible. Yeah. If you decide to stay where you are, you, other people are just going to be eating your lunch. I mean, exactly. and then you, it's like Amazon, you know, you, you've got to find ways to, uh, you know, compete with them uh, if you're in the delivery. So it's, it, it's tough out there, and you, you've, you've. I think you've. One of the things I find with improvement is a lot of people they want to improve by 10, 20 percent, and when you look at 10, 20 percent, it, it's like going on a diet and thinking I'll lose five pounds. You could do that by skipping breakfast every day for a week, and I think what we need to do is we need to get in that into that you know that mindset of how do I improve by 80 percent. So now you can't look at what you're doing and shave little bits off. Start yeah. with you're going to start with a blank sheet of paper and completely rethink your business. That's great, and and all the, that, the next subject I want to touch on is exactly that. You can only do that through the people, right? Through your people doing things differently. So, what what do what do what does what does the leaders? Let's start with the leadership. What do the leadership need to do differently for this to happen? Well, I think I, I think they've got to, yeah. You've got to have that diversity of thinking. If if it's just all done in the boardroom, then you you you, you might be struggling. You, I think you've got to open it up and get some of your more you know, trusted employees in. I remember I, I worked a friend of mine who worked at a company, and there was a guy that was sat there who never did anything, and it. He'd been there three months, my friend. And they said, that guy doesn't do anything. Why do we have him? And they said, oh, two years ago, he, he did something that saved the company 18 million. And we're just hoping he's going to think of something else. And for that, <laughs> but that was a guy on the shop floor that came up with that brilliant idea. And, you know, leadership um, is... I wrote this in an article today. A lot of people think about leadership is you've got to come up with all the answers. And actually, leadership is not about coming up with the answers. It's about coming up with all the questions and then yeah. figuring out the right people to ask to get the answers. And they have the courage to act on the answers, which is yeah. the, the other. I mean, yeah. so I hear a lot of leaders who do that service thing and, and who do want to let's involve people, let's talk to them. And then you know, I pro my transformation projects. It's, it's funny because we, we do these big transformation projects, Johnson and Johnson, as that, that type of thing. And they're always reporting out to the CEO of the C suite. And every, 
every time, without exception, every time this group of high goes goes to present, they scare the life out of the C-suite because of what they've come up with. Even yeah. though these are the high potential of the organization, they've worked on this project for a year, they've got a solid business plan, it's great, it's all stable to manage, it's all it's perfect, and it just terrifies them. So I mean it, the, the leadership is the courage to act on what they hear from from the team. Yeah, and no, ab- absolutely. And I think the other, one of the things I learned early in my career, and please don't don't think of me when I say this, because I am I am a consultant and didn't want to come in and help companies. But a lot of times I worked for companies where we brought consultants in yeah. who would then ask me what what I thought. Uh, and I would tell them, and they would go and tell the boss, and the boss would think it was the best thing since sliced bread. And all they've done is they've paid somebody a hundred thousand to uh-huh. tell them what somebody on their staff would have told them for free, but they weren't prepared to listen to them. Yeah. yeah. You know, so listen to your staff, especially if they've got you know good ideas. And I think people have got to be you've got to be bold and got to be brave. I mean, my brother, my brother uh, does, um, he, he's a mountain guide, uh, you know, ex, ex-military and did mountain survival and all that. And what he does is he does uh, team building and techs, you know, companies like NatWest on um, Yorkshire three-peat walks, team building, charity raising. But can't do that because you, you can't go out in large groups. So what he did was he created uh, challenges where he calculated how many times you have to go up and down a flight of stairs uh-huh. to do the equivalent of the Yorkshire Three Peaks. And yeah. Mount Everest, 1,970 times. I know because I climbed Mount Everest yeah. via the stairs. Well, that was him thinking outside the box of how could he – how could he get that, you know, get people exercise, get people thinking? And then he would do it on, on Zoom and he would get people to use Zoom and, and they would all go and do this uh, collectively. And, I, and I've seen other people that, you know, you, you probably see it on Facebook all the time. There's adverts where you can get a model for doing the equivalent of walking Adrian Wall in your own home. We're just going up and down the hallway. But, it, but it's that kind of creative thinking just... Go and look and see what other people have done and then ask, how could I apply that in my business? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one, of amazes, one of the things that amazes me, and I, I maybe I'm just wrong and, and people have done it, I don't know, but I'm always amazed when you look at, you know, Southwest Airlines came up with the, we only fly 737s, one plane, one crew model, blah, 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 blah. And then that gets copied by every budget airline. And yet, every time I go to rent a car at an airport, there's 23 different versions of car. Why is it there a car hire company who just rents out the, I think in the US, the most common car was a Toyota Corolla. Why is it there a, a, a car rental company who only does Toyota Corolla? Seats for, you know, We'll, we'll buy it in bulk. We've got one set of, and yet nobody's done that. And I don't understand why, you know, people are looking at other models like that and then asking, how do we apply that in our business to leverage, you know, cost, scalability, or optimization, whatever it might be? I was talking to a, someone, a, a client uh, last week who, they do, you know, like these back end uh, platforms, you know, data. Mm-hmm. That's, you know the chatbots that when you go into banking account and all that stuff, and they, they analyze the data and feed it back to the client and say, "Here's what we're learning about your business." And they had a, a car company as a client, and they were one of the first that, that in Brazil to get this model of um, hiring to people who want Uber drivers. So you know they they actually identified, oh, people are hiring your car to go out and work as Uber drivers. So they actually set up a business model based on that. And now I, just, I spoke to them last week. They've got a new thing, which is car as a service, which car is like you know, car as a service, yeah, like software as a service. Like basically, I don't know if you have them in, in Europe as well. But here we have you know like bicycles and stuff like that, and you go there yeah. with your cell phone and you scan the QR code and and you use it and then you leave it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they were doing that 
cars in, I can't remember what it's called. They had that in Brussels. Yeah. The same kind of thing. And you, you, you would just log in and it would tell you where the car was. You'd drive it, you'd drop it off, let, leave it filled up, and then off, off you'd go. Cheaper than car rental. Yeah, and it's so, again, going back to that point that we were making about there are new businesses and people will make lots and lots of money out of it. And sometimes people get frightened, like, well, but I'm not, I'm not a technical guru. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know algorithms. I don't know what AI is. I don't know about machine learning. I always say to them, you don't need to. You just need to know someone who does know. You know, what, what, what are your thoughts about coming out of, you come out of the IT world? So the, the, for me, one of the challenges in the IT world is that we have some really, really smart people, but they don't know business. So they can create AI, but now if you ask them what would they use it for, they'll use it for whatever it's being used for. And what we need to do is we need to be able to explain to people how this could be used and then ask you know ask an entrepreneur you find the most entrepreneurial person say here's a tool how would you use it and they might use it in a way that is completely different to what you would imagine and i think you know yeah, so, so get the experts but don't expect them to uh, tell you how to use the tool to get them to tell you what the tool is and you've you, you kind of got you, you've kind of got to do that. I mean, we we did we were you know doing big data. Oh my God, we've got to get big data. And I used to ask the I used to say all the time, "What's the question we're trying to answer? We don't know. Well, how do you know you've got the right data?" But that you know that mindset of you know big data, we'll just go and get all the data we can. You, you, you've got to have some entrepreneurial, innovative thinking around how to use that tool. So you know. And again, that's diversity of diversity of thinking. Entre you know, find out who are the most entrepreneurial people in your organisation. Ask them what they would do, and that's yeah. not only in the C-suite. And it's definitely, and it's not generally in the. Um, I mean, I'm an unbelievable leader. Entrepreneurial, not so much. I can, I, I do get great ideas, but I see other people, and I think. You know, I created that and I've sold it for seven euros. You're selling it for 40 euros and you sold 20,000 of them. How did you do that? Mm -hmm. and go and have a look at these things and, and be open to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting you know, talk about diversity of, of thought. I, mean, I, I fundamentally agree with that. Yeah. I, you know, 15, 15 years now I've been working virtually in that, you know, I'm based here in the south of Brazil and, and we do global projects. And, and that's deliberate because we're teaching these executives how to manage globally. You know, you've got a global team. You've got, you've got someone in Islamabad, someone in San Francisco, someone in Cork in Ireland. You know, how, how do you pull that together? But that's one of the great benefits of, of the pandemic is, is we've finally ruptured this paradigm of everyone has to sit in the same office, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, this frees you up to be diverse in terms of, you know, you can get people from all walks of life, all backgrounds. What, what are the lessons that you're seeing in terms of working well virtually? So, I, so I've, I, I worked in IT for, I, I guess, since 2000 when outsourcing first came in. So I've been, I've been working with teams in India, Asia, uh, and then led organizations. Uh, I think one of the things we have to do is that, you know, one of the criticisms I always say is, oh, their English isn't very good. So we, we, we've got to take the time. We have to tune our ears. And, and I find it very difficult sometimes I, uh, in that I, I'm on a call in two hours and I've got Russians and Indians. And it's difficult to listen to two different accents, one after the other, because I've got my Indian ear on and then I have to do my Russian ear so I can get it. But it, but it forces me, I have to communicate at a higher level. I have to keep things simple. I can't use large, complicated words or colloquialisms that are, um, are not there. So as a leader, you've... you've I hear again a lot of you know, criticism about you know these people are not that smart. When we the team in India, every single person was in the top one percent of, of the of their university. These people are smart, but you've got to give them clear instruction. You, if you if there's any ambiguity, you you 
lose them. So we've got to be, we've, we've got to be, uh, we've got to be crystal clear. And it, and that we like that puts the onus is on us as the customer or or the manager to make sure that you know we engage them and we give them clarity uh, and and check back. But what I find really helpful is that you know you you can get into that twenty four hour production cycle. So you know we have uh, the. We've been working on a. We're doing a, a, a VPN migration, so we'll be working on that uh, with one of the teams until nine o'clock tonight. But then tomorrow morning, uh, at four in the morning, the team in India will pick that up. So that opens our our window from you know four a.m. to nine nine p.m. Uh, where we can look to try and serve the customers. But I think as well, we need to be. We need to be mindful. One of the changes we're going to do today, it's happening at nine o'clock. And they said, "Do you have an issue with that?" And I said, "No, I don't." However, my team that are in uh, Kazan, that's going to be midnight for them. Yeah. So you know, maybe we need to do it. At, we need to do it at six a.m. Uh, for me, and that's nine a.m. for them, uh, and not just do everything you know based around my Monday to Friday nine to five because I you know. These are the these are the people that are doing the work. I'm not. I can lead half asleep. I don't yeah. want them doing technical work <laughs> half asleep. That would yeah. that would be bad. So I think we have to be mindful and um, you know and try and try and give them chunks of work that are clearly de clearly defined, but you know a, a complete piece that they can start and finish, and then empower them, leave them to get on with it. And yeah. in the tools as well, uh, you know, all of you know, videos really good. Uh, we we tend to do a lot with Zoom, um, uh, sorry, Teams now, but a lot of the time um, it's with cameras off. And what I find is that as soon as you get into a meeting where it's cameras on, the entire dynamic is completely different. And there are bandwidth issues, but we do need to. Uh, you know, the, the more you can do it with camera on, the more engaged you're going to get out of people. And we, we did one call, and we had to get a guy, an engineer uh, in Finland, and it was like, can we get hold of him? Now, I need this guy now. And the guy I'm talking to just went, <clears throat> and with the camera off, I would never have seen that what I'd asked was impossible. <laughs> Because I'm not getting that body language reaction, but you know, seeing him on camera, it was like, okay, what's plan B? So we've got to we, we we've got to learn to be able to communicate and pick up more on signals and sounds and uh, um, uh, and what's not said is a yeah. huge uh, a huge. Um, Which is interesting because those are the, the the competencies that that separate a good leader from I know a good leader. Um, you know, the, the empathy, the resilience, the emotional intelligence, all that kind of stuff. What, what I think is interesting is when I start with any group, literally any group in the world, and we're working virtually, they say, um, oh, this, this is really difficult, you know, do a project virtually and this, that, and that. Like, What's the number one biggest challenge you have in your biggest difficulty you have? And they always answer meetings. Our meetings are unproductive. When they're face to face, I said, you know, Doing it virtually, the problem is not whether it's virtual or face to face. The problem is you're not in good meetings. Yeah, right? I'm, you yeah. suck at meetings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So let's learn how to run effective meetings. Let's learn how, yeah. to, learn how to run effective projects. And and then it doesn't matter. With, you know, yes, there are things face to face that, that work better. There are things that that you that work better virtually. Um, but it, but it's knowing the competencies that make the difference, isn't it? Yeah. So so for me, when with the start of the pandemic, I, I, I was running a, a 100% virtual. First time I'd ever done that. Um, I never. I only met two people on the project, and that was because I went and spoke at a CIO event in Pune, India. Otherwise, I wouldn't have met anybody. And usually, there's some degree of uh, local, um, but this was this was just. 100% virtual, never met anybody. And what I found is I'm quite an engaging leader, but in that virtual, I had to double, double what I did. And I had to make it a point of, so we were on a call, we were on a call, hmm, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, and I'm dealing with a lot of Indian people. And we, we had this complex 
technical update on a, a virtual private network that we were trying to move it, and we were lo we were losing the customer's business because it wasn't quite going right. And halfway through, I had to say, oh, by the way, guys, I just need to interrupt you. And they said, what is it? And I said, uh, Joss Butler's out. It looks like you're going to give us a spanking in this uh, – <laughs> In this other, and everybody on the team, like you know, Indian guys cheered, and I thought, you know, and I did that deliberately because what I found was that if you can bring, you've got to bring an element of social. There is, if there's no social, the engagement's not the same. So I, I, I would try and make meetings a little bit longer so we could have that chat. You know, how's the weather in Kazan? What's it doing in India? Did you see the cricket? Kind of have a 15 minute water cooler before some of the meetings are. Not every single meeting, but did that to, to try and break it down. Because what, what I find is that in a lot of these meetings, when we get straight into the meeting, and if you say, if, if I've never seen you face to face and we've never had any dialogue, if you say something stupid, I think you're an idiot. If we've had any kind of dialogue, discourse, or engagement before, and you say something stupid, I'll say, sorry, what did you say? That sounded stupid, and you'll give them a. You, you are more forgiving and give them a chance to correct. Whereas if it's just a hundred percent business, no camera, Sam, you just you just sat there thinking, what an idiot. Uh, and we've got to get out of that mindset and, and try and create sense of community, sense of engagement. And as I say, for me, I had to I had to double what I did, and I was and I was I was already doing double. What anybody else was doing on the face-to-face -face stuff, but how they're coping, God only knows. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. days. I think um, I think the pandemic has killed command and control structures dead. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. It never worked. You just managed to get away with it. Now you're dead. If you're not an engaging, inspiring leader, you're going to be out of a job very, very quickly. Yeah, so, I 100% agree with that. And the, so let, let, let's talk about another aspect of, of that leadership, which is something leaders forget to you know the empathy piece. But the um, when people are working from home, right, there are other elements that come into play, right? They're, they're looking after kids, they're looking after sick relatives. Maybe you know, they, maybe they, they don't have a room, a room. How many people have a room? In their house, where they can they can work from, and and burnout as well. You know, they, if you're working on a global project, you want to make a good impression. You know, people are trying to work 16, 18, 24 hours a, a, a day. To, you know, how do you help deal with the the, the people? <laughs> you know, the real life stuff that comes in as well. Well, so I think we have I think we have to be flexible. Uh, and we've we've been doing a migration of seventy five sites, and one guy, one Indian guy, has been involved throughout. Um, the, the the customers in the UK, he's in Pune, so there's a, there's a four and a half hour, five and a half hour difference, and they're constantly wanting to have meetings at um, five o'clock. So immediately, that's nine thirty for him. Mm -hmm. So what I try and do is I try and have the meetings. You know, let's let's have the meetings at nine nine a.m. in the morning. So any meeting we want to get anything done, let's have it when it's a good time for all of us. And you just got to be you just got to be mindful of the time and, and you know tell be tell people, you know, come in late tomorrow or, or send them off home. Be, be aware of the, you know, when did they start and when did they leave? I, I mean one of the one of the things that I remember from my own experience, I was working for DHL in Prague. And um, I uh, arrived at work at quarter past quarter past eight, and um, one of the senior managers came into my office and he said, uh, "Trent Gold, I think you need to be aware that we start at eight o'clock in this company." And I said, "What?" And he said, "You need to be here at eight o'clock." And I said, "Okay." So, and any time I'm not here at eight, you're going to come and give me a, a chewing out. And he went, yeah, because we start at eight. I said, great, happy to do that. Will you do me a favor? Will you come and kick me out of my office at six? Because I was here till 11 last night, which is against company policy, because we only work eight to five. 
So if you're going to stand at my door at eight in the morning wondering where I am, I want you kicking me out at five o'clock. Or you can... Absolutely. A few choice words. And he just looked at me and I said, oh, by the way, not only was I in the office at 11 last night, but the two previous evenings. Sure. So I kind of feel free to come and go when I please because I'm doing 50 more days at the moment. Which, which again goes back to that command and control thing. I mean, if you're yeah. not managing by results, then, then, <sighs> then you're in trouble. I mean, it's like, okay, here's what we need to deliver. Here's, here, here are the parameters. Here are the resources that are available. We want you to do it in a way that's sustainable, that doesn't break any laws. But apart from that, go do it your way. If you, if you want to take a two-hour CS in the middle of the day, that's fine. Just just deliver what you need to deliver in a way that's legal and, and sustainable. So, so I wrote a book called Fast about four things, um, four things you need in order to be successful. Focus, clear goals, objectives, communicate, and everybody understand. Second is accountability. You, people have got to know. Um, you need to know who's involved. You need to tell them what you expect, hold them accountable for outcomes, and then follow up. Simplicity, you know, understand how you're going to be successful, communicate that. And the last part is transparency. How are we performing? You know, and a lot of leaders, if you're on a, uh, a diet where you're going to lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks, you don't want to know how the person's feeling. You need them in your office every Monday on the scales and see the data of, you know, is the weight going down? Is it going up? If it's going down, pat on the back, good job, well done. If it's going up, we need to change the approach. But a lot of people manage by gut feel. And if you if you have no metrics, what are you holding people accountable to? Oh, I know, when you're here at nine and did you look like you were working late? You're you're focused on the wrong things, and you're gonna you're gonna piss your you're gonna piss your employees off with that approach. And and not only that, but then not only that, they, you ask managers, senior leaders, who like who are your, who are your um, high potential, who are your top performers, who are your top not even high potential, which is another element, but top who yeah. are your top. Oh, it's John, it's Mary, it's this. Okay, how do you know that? Oh, because they always do what I want them to do. That's not a metric. <laughs> so I was working for I was working for Henkel, and I'm a I'm a huge sports fan, and so I love metrics because when we do your review at the end of the year, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you're bottom of the table, you're getting relegated, <laughs> and, and we don't have to discuss whether you should or you shouldn't. If we've if you if we've been looking at the league table every week, it doesn't lie. And it's not a surprise to you. It's not a surprise to me. And if we've been working on how to move you forward, we can do that. Uh, but we, we used to do this. You had to grade people uh, low, medium, uh, strong, and top. And we had to do it for our own departments. And then the heads of the departments would meet. And only 10% of the people could be in the top. And if somebody had got somebody that they thought was, you know, pushed up to 12%, now I've got. I might have to take somebody out of my top to accommodate. And we were doing this, and um, I said, "Oh, this guy, you know, this guy's uh, Dave. He's top." And he said, "Well, I don't think he's good as as good as Bob." And I said, "Well, so tell me about why Bob's good." He said, "Well, he's really critical. We need him." And went, hmm, "That's not about performance. That's about need." Yeah, but you you don't understand that without him we can't do anything. Again, that's not about performance, that's need. Tell me what he's done that makes him top. And he said, well, tell me what Dave's done that's made him top. I said, he's delivered 100% of his projects on time, on budget. He has achieved 100% service level attainment for the entire year. And he's the only person in my organization that's achieved 100% in both of those categories for the entire year. And my boss said, Dave's top. This is a guy we need him, he ain't top. If you well, don't match it, yeah. who are you judging people on? Are yeah, you can you know can't. that's why it's important is because not only do, do you have to know that for you know for, for your people, but in any business now, the function only lasts six months before it changes. Yeah. So yeah. you have to 
at a business level. You have to look at your talent pool, irrespective of, of, of which department or which project they happen to be in at the moment. You have to be you have to know your, your top performers as a talent pool because tomorrow you're going to pull one from here, one from there, one from there and make a new pod. I, I got into trouble with HR. I was always getting into trouble with HR. Um, I got into trouble with HR because our CEO came up with this approach of pay for performance. When it comes to the annual bonus, when it comes to the annual pay rises, I think we were, we, were, you know, we had like a 2% pay rise. So you would give four to the top performers, two to the standard, none to the uh, medium and lower performers. So, it, you know, that's how we were devising the pool. Mine was the only department that did that. Everybody else was giving everybody 2% because they didn't want to, I don't want to piss people off. What, you mean you don't want to upset your top performers? I have no problem in telling my bottom performers, oh, by the way, I've given your pay rise to the top performer. And if you want to do something about it, then you need to be, a, and I'll help you be a top performer. But if you're a yeah. bottom performer and you don't want to do anything, you, your career's on the slide. And, and, and they kept saying, we want to do this and we need to, we need to make sure we're paying our top performers the best. So I created this model that looked over three years and it ranked performance. And I gave, for, for this year, I gave you 125% of your performance rating. For last year, 100%, year before, 75. So I was kind of, you know, weighing it, depending on, and that gave everybody uh, a score of their performance. And then I plotted salary. And then I plotted the people. And what we found was that what you should have is you should have a, an ellipse like this, an ellipse that's like this, the, you know, low performers, low pay, high performers, high pay. And what we had was low performers were getting great money and uh, some of the high performers were getting the lowest money. So I created this tool, and then when it came to allocating the money, I was giving some of the people who were paid at the bottom of their pay band, not 4%, but 10% to recompense. I got into trouble for HR. They told me, you're not allowed to have that visibility into the data. I said, but we're supposed to be paying high performers. How are people making these decisions? And they said, well, they're not doing it on the data. They're creating a policy. I was like, I don't, even know, I don't even know how to respond to they're not using the data. So what are they using? Average weight, skin tone, length of hair, attention. Which team do support? All these United fans get less, all the Arsenal fans get more. <laughs> And Manchester United fans get Man United fans get nothing. <laughs> I, I think there'll be universal agreement on that, apart from all, all the Man United fans in, in Malaysia. <laughs> so I want to talk about football for a minute, if I can, because for me, I'm a huge football fan, and, and I, I've been a Leeds United fan since since Don Revy. And um, you put my, my 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 father was a professional football player in Scotland. Really? Who did he play for? Hibs played for Hibernian. I saw Hibs play Leeds in, I think it was 1967 or something, in the Inner City Fairs Cup. They yeah. came. And, and uh, so, uh, so it's, I'm going to talk more about leadership than, than um, football, but um, I, I'm sure a lot of people in your neck of the woods will know Marcello, Marcelo Bielsa. And he is an absolute god. At Leeds now, and he he's done something that you know I'm a I'm a very good leader. I'm, I'm fast. I'm dynamic. And if you ask me how long it took to change culture, I would tell you it, within six months you can start to see change. Within twelve months it'll be start to be embedded. Within eighteen months it's sustainable. Uh, and beyond the change, the culture at Leeds in six weeks, he took over, and six weeks later the same starting eleven that finished mid-table, couldn't attack, couldn't defend, tediously boring, um, played stop, we were the favourites to get back up, and we spanked them 4 nil. And the commentators were like, are we sure this is the same 11 guys that finished last season? And he changed the culture in six weeks, and yet 
we talk about leadership and the, the importance of communication. He doesn't speak English. Not only does he not speak English, he doesn't say a lot. So this feeling that uh, leadership, you need to be a great communicator, sorry, that's that's not true. And if you actually look at Bielsa, a lot of it is about, you know, his passion, his commitment, his energy, his integrity, his drive, determination, and that's what he uses to create the culture. So it's not necessarily about communication. It's clearly not about what you say. Clearly, it's about what you do because they have no clue what he's saying. And, and One of my pet peeves is, you know, these organisations who spend millions, literally millions of dollars on competency frameworks. And here are our competencies. And you say to the manager, "Do you know what this has to do with performance?" And no, it's just something HR needs us to do. And it's like. Okay, so you're, as a company, you're saying one thing. You go on the website and it's here. We care about our people. Here are our competencies. Here are our values. And then you go speak to the leaders or, or the people in the shop floor. And it's like, no, we just have to get done what we need to get done. And it's like, and you wonder why there's this massive disconnect. It's like, I mean, you're basically, it's like you've got a horse and carriage and you're putting a horse at the front, a horse at the back and a horse at each side and saying, go run. And you wonder why the carriage explodes apart. So I'll, I'll share with you, and you can share it with the audience if you if you like. I created what I call a strategic, a strategic alignment challenge. Uh, basically, it's a pyramid. And at the bottom, it's culture, who we are. Above that is purpose, why we do it. Above that is mission, what we do. Uh, above that is vision, where do we want to go? And above that is goals. And, and I, I work with a few companies and I ask them to fill that in. And you can see them, they start filling it in and then they realize that none of it is aligned. You know, we, we, we have this culture of innovation and yet we're a company who, we're, we, we, we're, not, we're not an innovative company. That's not, that doesn't fit with our mission or vision. And it doesn't fit with our purpose. And if you can get all those things aligned, we can move it together. And I think one of the, one of the and so I'll, I'll share that with you. People can download it. It's a simple, it's a simple chat, but it just forces you to write all four of them, one under the other, uh, and then say, you know, does that stack up, or is it like a football kit where you've got purple socks, green shorts, and an orange top? And you think, yeah, that that's that never going to work. You probably discover as well is that most companies, in my experience, have this schizophrenia between the culture that they actually have mm. and the culture that they admit to themselves or would like to have. You know, it's a, you go in there and say, oh, yeah, this is our culture. And you go, no, it's not. Because I'm a consultant. I come in from the outside. I can tell exactly what your culture is within five minutes. Yeah. And, and 90% of the time, what they say their culture is, is what they would like it to be. It's not what it is. Yeah, and it's not what they live. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Of a three-step approach to creating culture. Say it so people can understand it and follow it. Live it so they can see what it looks like. And reinforce it. Find the culture ambassadors, advocates. Recognize them and put rituals in place that reinforce the culture. If you do those three things, boom, 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 it will happen. But the other thing about culture, which is interesting, is um, what's in it for me? And when Marcello Bielsa uh, came to Leeds, we were thinking about selling Calvin Phillips. We were 13th in the second division, in, in, the, in the second tier, the first division, I think they call it. Um, and Calvin Phillips was, he was a, um, a midfield player, and he was, he, we were thinking of selling him. He was okay, not great. And, and Marcello Bielsa came in and pulled him to one side and said, I'm going to move you to central. I'm going to move you to be a defensive midfielder. Uh, and if I do that, within 12 to 18 months, you'll be an England international. So not we're going to sell you, but if you do what I say, in 18 months, you'll be playing for England. He's in the England squad. He's already played three or four times. He's now a regular part of that squad. Imagine 
the buy-in that he's going to get when it's now not what you want me to do for you. It's what you want me to do for me. And, yeah. and Bielsa wants Leeds to play in an attacking, dynamic, aggressive way. It's great for the fans. The fans love it. It does give us a little bit of a heart attack. The players love it. Who wants to come and play a boring, boring game? It makes you a better player. So it increases. So it's, the fans love it, you love it, and it makes you more valuable. How can they not buy into that culture? So when you're thinking about creating a culture, how can you make it interesting for the people, make it better for them personally, and make it better for the customer? If you can achieve those three things, you'll create a culture in, you know, in record time, uh, happy employees, happy customers, happy shareholders. Interesting though, I, I completely agree, I, and I've also seen the, the opposite destroy the culture, which is that when that thing you were talking about necessity, right? 60 70 percent of the coaching engagements I do are this guy or woman is a senior vice president, right? Um, brilliant at the job, great, great lawyer, great uh, accountant, great, great salesperson, whatever. Nobody can stand to talk to them. They're, they're rude, they're arrogant, they're this, that. And it was a why did you promote this person up to senior vice president? It was like, oh, well, because they were really good at their job and we were frightened to lose them. It's like you, you destroyed the whole culture. You basically said to the organization and to this person, you can act any way you want and get what you want, which is your promotion and more money and all that. And all you have to do is every now and again, someone from HR will complain about it and, and, and you have to put up with that. I said, no wonder you, the organization's in a mess. Due to you, that thing that you were talking about, reinforcing the culture, you, you need, when someone steps out, I said, we talk, talk about football. When, when Arteta blocked um, Audubon, um from, from the, the North London derby, right? Um, on who? Obama, Obama Yang. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that captain, because he turned up late. And he, and he, he said, go sit in the stand and watch the game. And that's brilliant. That, that's reinforcing the culture. Instead of saying, well, you're the captain, you're our top scorer. I know you came in late. It's North London Derby. Come and play. So little things like that either destroy or reinforce the, the culture. Yeah, I, I, I wrote an article this morning. I created a. I, I love to create graphics, and I'll sh I'll share another we, we can share with the audience. And it was the it's the five stages of leadership, and uh, for me, it starts off with informal, so you don't have the position, and are you demonstrating leadership tendencies? Are you recognizing people, supporting people, volunteering, stepping up, looking to do the right thing? Then there's the hands-on leader where. You're leading from the front. You're probably a team leader, and, and you're actually contributing to the success. So, you know, in football parlance, it's where you're the player manager. So, yeah, yeah you get to decide the tactics, but you're still going to be involved doing it. And then there's the expert leader, where you're promoted because of your expertise. And, you know, a, a lot of people go through that. And then the next level of leadership is what I call the engaging, empowering leader. And at this point, you have to become an, uh, a, um, a leadership expert rather than an expert that's a leader. Because now it's not about what you know about the technology, the process, the business. It's what you know about people. And the, this is the place where that's the barrier where people fall. And then the fifth level is what I call inspirational leadership, where you're looking at where you are basically involved in strategy uh, culture you have the light you have the lightest touch on employees but it, but you have to do it in an impactful way so you've got to be uh, inspiring but it's that gap there from from expert uh, to engaging empowering which is a completely different skill set what got you to hear it, it, you actually won't be successful as an expert leader unless you develop some leadership and you definitely won't get to that next level because to get, you know, for me, it's like me now, I'm leading a project where we're working in Azure, which I know nothing about, and we're doing a voice over IP, a virtual private network migration, which I know nothing about. So I can't be an expert leader. I'm a leader of experts. Yeah. 
But I know nothing about this. So it's all about the people, you know, putting them in a position where they can be successful. But as you say, uh, I was the fifth program manager. The other four were all experts, but none of them could deliver it because they weren't able you know, to create a, a simple vision, put people first and create progress. And uh, yeah, I think the statistic from Gallup is that 87% of the time companies promote the wrong people. And again, coming back to football, Marcello Bielsa, we love him. He stopped playing at 25 because he realized he wasn't going to be a good footballer. Phenomenal manager. Um, Jurgen Klopp, unbelievable manager. I think he played in the German second division. Not a very good player, great manager. Pep Guardiola played for Barcelona and Spain. Great player, great manager. Jose Mourinho, I don't even know whether he played football. I think his dad played and he tried and failed. So being an expert player doesn't make you an expert manager. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an Arsenal fan, so I'm Arsene Wenger. Um, same thing. You know, he, he was a, a second division centre half who stopped his career early and decided, no, no, I'm going to be a manager. This is this is what I need to do. Well, you probably you probably. Um... I don't know how petty you are, but you might have laughed when Chelsea had to let Frank Lampard go. I mean, guy, it was phenomenal, a phenomenal player. Their highest ever goal scorer, I think. He passed, Dix, uh, he passed Dixie Dean, I think, was their goal scorer. Amazing player, but when it came to leading and managing at that top level, couldn't do it. Didn't have this. Didn't have this. That doesn't mean you'll never be able to do it. But just because you're an expert player doesn't mean you're a, a, a master tactician or a leader of people uh, and, and can create that. So choose well, your wisely. Yeah, it goes back to the competencies, doesn't it? It's a, it's a different set of competencies. It's like, and I liked your analogy about, you know, the, 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 the leader, the aspiring leader and then the team manager, you know, you know like, like a... A player manager because you get someone like maybe Solskjaer at Man United, and obviously he in that kind of player manager role, he was good. You know, he's he, he, he was, he's obviously got some talent there. But then all of a sudden you put him in the you're now just the manager, and he's struggling. And, and it's there's just a subtle difference between almost like dividing your time between um, player manager. And, and just being the manager, it's the same thing that you were talking about, dividing the time between the expert leader and, and then just being the leader. It's, yeah. it's those subtle differences that make the, make it. And I think I think the 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 challenge. So I read I read a really good book. I don't know if you it was either a book or an article, and it was called Star Trek Leadership, and it was All about right. it was about the leadership style of Captain Kirk, who. Mm -hmm. If they need to fight a monster, Kirk goes down and does it. If they need somebody to date the uh, good-looking alien, Captain Kirk goes and does it. It was all about heroic leadership. And then you've got uh, Star Trek Next Generation with John yeah. luc Picard. When they've got a problem, he gets his inner circle into the ready room. They talk about strategy. And then he sends down the head of security to fight the monster. He sends the head of diplomacy to go and negotiate. And he deploys resources. And a lot of people, we cannot give up the desire to be the hero and let other people be the hero. So a lot of people... They can't do that because they want to be the hero, which means you can't get above expert leader because you have to be involved. Always that you don't have the confidence to let go of your expertise and focus on the people and let them, you know, just accept, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, when uh, somebody's managing a second division football team, the manager, it was if he was a good player, he's probably better than every single player, but you can't go and play. So you have to let them do it and let sometimes let good enough be enough and have enough people doing good enough rather than one person doing great, which you could do. But people are reluctant to you know, take their hands off either because they want to be the hero or they're not confident in their people skills to let go of the expertise. If you don't let go, 
you you won't you won't you, you won't go higher. No, now we don't need another hero. We need somebody who creates more heroes. That's that's how you become uh, a great leader and move up. The more heroes you can create, the higher you'll go. The more heroic you need to be, you're, you're going to be a limitation to yourself. I completely agree. Completely agree. And, that, and that's a wonderful note to, for us to end on. Good. That, that was just wonderful. Thank you ever so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your knowledge. It was, it was a pleasure. Um, it was a ton of fun as well. It's always good to talk football Thank with someone. Thank you for not being a Manchester United or Chelsea supporter. <laughs> I've always so, respected Arsenal. I've always respected Arsenal because in the seventies, you know, it was Leeds, Liverpool, and Arsenal. A lot of respect between the teams, and uh, absolutely, I, I completely agree. And it's nice to have Leeds back in in the Premiership and yeah. and, and do well in the Premiership. Um, tell me how. The easiest way for people to, to follow you, to get in touch with you. I mean, you, you, you do such great work. I'm sure there's going to be a ton of people watching who are going to want to get in touch. What's the easiest way to do that? So I'm the only Gordon Treadgold in the entire world. So if you if you pop Gordon Treadgold into Google, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. If you want to email me, it's gordon at gordontreadgold.com. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. It was a pleasure. Hopefully we can count on you again uh, at some oh, point. Absolutely. Um, when, when, Leeds and, when Leeds play Arsenal in the FA Cup final next season, call me up. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's a day. Thank you ever so much. Have a wonderful rest of your yeah. evening. Thanks, then. You bye too. Bye.